Ladies and gentlemen, the deep thoughts. So, let's see here. It's been a couple weeks since I made an episode. And uh, I've just been sort of, you know, pushing out all the old episodes and looking at new stuff and trying to find out what would be interesting to cover. Because, you know, it's got to interest me too. And, uh, And I stumbled onto something. It has been sort of an annoying reality to me my entire life. And finally had it explained a couple times in videos, and I've been watching a good half dozen really long three-hour videos that have archaeologists and geologists and historians, anthropologists, physicists, all looking into the megalithic structures that man has created in the past and perhaps someone different than man has created. And if you're like me, you, in life, there'll be, when you see a mystery, for instance, you will feel the mystery, you will feel the frustration of its existence, but you obviously are being shocked by its debut in your mind and debut in life as you've experienced it, and you get frustrated that you feel it, you can't quite put the mystery into words, you can't define it, but immediately your soul rushes in to try and solve the mystery. And of course, being brand new to the mystery, you don't have any data, you don't have any logic, you don't know, you know, where to look. So let me give you some examples for, for the sake of argument about what I'm talking about. And these are the ones that I, I deal with personally, right? I look at the pyramids of Giza. Massive structures. Uh, one of them is built very special. The Great Pyramid is built completely different than the other two sort of bad copies. But then when you start studying Egyptology, you look at the dozens of bent pyramids, step pyramids, hybrids between the two. And it starts to blow your mind as to who built these things and why. When you go into South America, you have this Inca group of folks that built a bunch of amazing things, but there's this even more amazing group of people before them that built the absolute, totally precise and gigantic monolithic stuff. There are totems in... All, all in the Americas, south and north, totems of men with beards who are the wise men with parables attached to them about how they came out of the sky or what have you. And the indigenous life form in South and North America, neither of which had the ability to grow facial hair, somehow carved a person with a beard. And they've carved big marble statues of what they would call the gods with curly beards. So a civilization that couldn't grow hair on their face somehow worshipped to the point and to the extent of creating sculptures of them and attaching to them the lore of helping to sort of set up the continent and set up society, this group of bearded people. And so you hear these things, you see these things, and it took the internet... God, 20 years to really start correlating and cross-referencing data. You know, the internet really, uh, you know, from my experience, took off in 1996 in terms of HTTP protocol really blowing up and becoming more organic and you didn't need, you know, yellow book directories to find URLs online. AltaVista was out there, Yahoo debuts, you know, for search engines to find things. And at that point, you have this 
this incredible move to, to get the historical data online, photographs, movies, but then the devices we took the photographs with sucked. You know, 35 millimeter cameras and the bad super, you know, one megapixel digital cameras. Then there's no real way to capture movies, uh, you know, without a $3,000 video card. And so it's taken us 20 years to get to the point where we can now just flip on the, you know, YouTube or go take a deep dive through a bunch of article chains and threads online before you're going to actually get, uh, you know, a great three-dimensional view of something, right? But now let's go back to our sort of structures. We have these commonalities between continents. Everyone's familiar with Stonehenge, right? You have the series of the same structure, and if you're from Ireland, you'll know you have these altars all over the country where you have two vertical rocks with the one rock across the top. And sometimes they're just beautifully honed where the, the two vertical rocks are very flat on top, and then the, the top one just fits on there willy-nilly, however you want it. And then you have, you know, where there's a lot more work to it. Things have been notched, right? And it fits very precisely. And so it just keeps evolving and evolving, right? Well, we have that technique all over the world. And we have it excavated out of, you know, sand dunes in all of Africa, South Africa, North Africa, Egyptian Africa. And these rocks are perfectly mitered, 90 degree angles, seemingly utterly uh, without man-made tools, aside from perhaps some sort of circular saw, some sort of ability to just cut it with a device, you know? And, you know, there, there's, you know, uh, there's very few naysayers about this, but in case you're trying to suggest that traditional mechanisms of, you know, taking a rock to hit a rock and then honing it out smooth and making these perfect 90 degree angles, I would say you are a coward of science, you know. When you see a 90 degree turn in granite, right, surface, top surface of the rock and then 90 degree turn straight down the right or left side or front and back, however you want to look at it, and then that rock goes for 50 feet, and there's less than one five hundredth of an inch of deviation in this rock, which is several of the stones in Egypt in the Great Pyramids and so forth. That level of precision is, is really beyond the capability of mankind to conceive, one five hundredth of an inch. You can't conceive of that except to say, wow, I bet that's really accurate but you can't see it with your eyes. And yet we have perfectly mitered rocks, right? And let's, let's take it one step further for the brain. So you got top edge to side edge, 90 degree angle, perfect. Okay, now bring that back to a corner. So now you have three sides, three completely adjacent sides, the front, the side, and the top. And there's a corner there. And the corner is perfect. Perfect. Now let me uh, remind you here, as much as granite is very, very strong, if you go and dig a rock up in one location and quarry it and make it perfect, and then you carry it all the way to its destination, right? And you bump it. You bump it once. Those corners are gone forever. Those edges are gone forever. Right? So these rocks are everywhere and they're all over history. And they're all, when I say they're all over history, you know, that sounds like a very typical statement you've heard your entire life. Uh, but the way I want you to think about it is almost like a time travel movie. They are in time all around the surface of the planet Earth. Different cultures, right? Now, before we get into some of the assertions, I need to free up your mind a little bit if you have been following official history. Now, I've said this several times on the show, but I've never said it so on point, so let's get this straight. The white 
males of Europe are a very insecure group of individuals and they are very greedy with all things and we don't have any problem with them understanding their greed for money and we don't have usually an under, uh, problem understanding their greed for control over mankind that's what their whole lot is about right they're all about war keeping us fighting each other so they can do whatever they want okay they are also greedy when it comes to history they fear history probably more than anything else. One, we can see their deeds repeated over time and so that we can, we could escape their Ponzi schemes if we could ever fucking remember anything for any length of time, right? But when it comes to history, and you can see this blatantly in history, okay, and hopefully this will free your mind up because we need to really loosen up our grip on what we think is true and false because I could see a bunch of people from, you know, official universities coming in and going, oh no, I learned this and I memorized and repeated this, never fucking thought once and I got a degree that says, hey, you're a good memorizer and repeater and you're, you're such a good indoctrinated little dogma boy that you'll never be able to see the truth if you don't free yourself. Now, here's the way history goes when it comes to this ancient architecture and ancient civilizations. One, you're to think that we didn't have any ancient civilizations beyond perhaps the Sumerians, right? As soon as you get past maybe 5000 BC, everyone turned into idiots, nobody knew anything, there were no accomplishments, everybody was stupid. You know, the only thing you're allowed to look at are cave paintings and pottery here and there. You're to think that you owe them the Masons what have you, everything. They saved you. All right, and there's ice ages we could throw in here as well, but here's the thing. The reason why the Sumerians and the Egyptians get to remain in the history books as pre-white civilized histories because they were written into the Bible. They're written into documents. People remember what it was like, and they have passages and songs and books that they've written that talk about the old times. And so the the white bankers of Europe were unable, your descendants from Rome were unable to erase those two previous civilizations. Now consequently, what did they do to, to usurp the intelligence of Egypt? Okay, Greece is, you know, several thousand years later. You have Stonehenge which is reconstructed in 1954 from some ruins that were down the road. And they literally went and took the rocks and repaired them with cement bottoms and reinforced them and then built this fucking place in 1954. And they didn't necessarily lie that they built it in 1954. They just never mentioned it when the Americans came over and got all googie-eyed over it, right? But what did they do? They date Stonehenge prior to the Egyptian pyramids. To make sure that Whitey got there before Blackie. It's that sick. Okay? Now, what's interesting is, is you have Asia remaining quite a bit of a mystery. It wasn't until probably the 80s or 90s that Americans were allowed to think through teaching that China has been civilized for 3,000 years. You know, that was an epiphany in the late 70s, early 80s. Wow, these people have been around for a long time. Now, meanwhile, you've got pyramids in uh, China. You have unbelievable structures in Cambodia. I mean, it's all over the world, quite frankly. If I I forget to mention a country, it will have to be a, a pretty rural country not to have some sort of monolithic structures as a part of its indigenous species following their their beliefs and their structural capabilities, right? But now come over to the Americas. You have, you know, Christopher Columbus supposedly coming over here to discover gold for the Queen of Spain, right? His name wasn't Christopher Columbus, but whatever. The guy was a complete creep, but we'll make an episode on him a different day. But what happened is, is Europe didn't know anything about the Americas, at least officially speaking, right? The Vikings obviously had come over 
Um, Asia, I think, was actually a descendant from the Americas, not the other way around. But you have a culture that, you know, supposedly looked really primitive to the people coming over from Europe. And undoubtedly there was some truth to that. But South America tells a completely different tale of how long these folks had been around and how sophisticated they had been. But in history, what happens is this. They'll say, oh, you know, if, if you were part of the bank, banking oligarchy who's trying to control reality and history, here's the kind of conversation that they have. Researcher comes back from the Americas. They sit in council and they say, okay, tell me what you found. Well, we found an incredibly advanced civilization that seems to have been, um, seems to have gone, but they have the same type of architecture we found in Egypt, in Sumerian times, and some of these crazy, amazing monolithic structures. We see rocks that are 200, no, 1,200 tons, huge rocks, precision cut. And then on top of that, there's this current culture called the Incas who have definitely figured out some of the old techniques, but they don't have any ability to refine rocks, so they're really just sort of stacking rocks, right? And so then the bankers go, well, has this been reported? Has anyone reported this before? No. Okay. Well, we can't allow them to establish that they have been here first because we might lose some of our indigenous European community people to potentially take pilgrimage over to South America and try to find their roots. So in the room will be some guy who's part of the historical society and they'll say, okay, you, you are in charge of creating a believable fake history for these people. But, you know, go with the standard themes that they're savages, that they're barbarians, and try to work that into anything that you find. Yes, sir. Some time passes. The Astorian group gathers. They get a bunch of folks together, the Royal Society, Academy, or whatever, of history, and they go across the pond. They find gorgeous pyramids, step pyramids, ornate, beautiful they establish very quickly that the rock that these pyramids are built out of doesn't exist natively at the location. So now they have to contemplate, holy shit, how did they move all this stuff here? They look at it even further and realize there's a foundation that's been laid to make sure that the pyramid doesn't slide around and move around. They realize that bricks have no mortar. They're just interlocked, you know, maybe with a, like a T-joint. The keystone locks, right? And for those of you who don't know what those are, I'll show a picture of it. But it's essentially an H. It's like two T's that are connecting at the bottom. And they notch them out of the top of rocks and they supposedly pour precious metals in there to kind of keep them locked together. Now the funny thing about keystoning is if you don't keystone with another piece of stone, there ain't nothing that, that uh, crappy metal is going to do to hold two 1,000 ton rocks together. If they want to move, you're a little... Uh, your little keystone, you know, lock's going to break. It just will. But so they come over to South America. They look at these amazing, you know, uh, Mayan pyramids, and they say, uh, or Inca and, and, you know, the Aztecs, which came about later on. They look at these creations, and they start these rumors that these people were barbaric, that they sacrificed babies, Right? Because there's nothing more amazingly horrible than sacrificing a child, right? And so the way that they create evidence for this is even more sick. They, the, the, the lesser of the two is that they actually take, you know, grease pencil and coal and they draw pictures, kind of arbitrary, kind of gross pictures, which doesn't match in any way, shape, or form the amazing capabilities of these people right? The, the Mayans, the Incas, the prehistoric, you know, monolithic culture that put this thing together, they have shown aptitude on levels that if they saw a human being and wanted to render a likeness, it would look exactly like that human being if they wanted to. But these little grease pencil drawings of, you know, some sort of uh, priest holding up a child with blood hanging out, you know, popping out of them in little drops, little cartoony drawings, are all drawn by Europeans, 
and then blamed on the local culture to create the thing you saw in Avatar, right? Which is to call them savages, which is the Doctor Who episode, Kinda. That's where Avatar was ripped off, FYI. The project name was Kinda, as I understand it, in Manhattan Beach. And they will not let the dates go back further than, say, you know, I think that the, the most credit I've ever heard attributed to South American capabilities was about 750 A.D., <laughs> right? But what's that do to the mind of man? Well, imagine you're South American and you believe this a white man interpretation of your history. I'm hoping that this isn't the case. I'm hoping that they're, they're more intelligent than this. But what's interesting is, is you get these sort of pre-censorship, you know, mouth-breathing architects, or arch I should say architect, or sorry, I should say um, anthropological wannabes, uh, these um, archaeology wannabes, and they just, they'll do anything to get employed. Because they know they have an esoteric career that few people have. I mean, think about it. How many times do you go to a bar and you ask somebody what they do and they say they're an archaeologist? It doesn't happen very often. So these people have to kiss ass to remain employed. And what if they ascend through the system and they keep getting these, you know, $10,000 a year raises? Are you going to rock the boat? And then someone whispers in your, your, your ear, hey, our culture didn't make these things. But, you know, when they believe that we did it, they tend to achieve more in school because they feel like they have the heritage of those that did make this. I mean, what blows me away is, uh, you know, on one level is that if you were an Egyptian child and you believed that your ancestors made the pyramids, which they didn't, but you did believe that as a child, you should be able to, you know, look out your school window at the three pyramids of Giza and go, I am going to be the best, you know, mathematician because those things are based on pi. I'm going to be the best, you know, structural engineer because those things are one of the most ingenious things that's ever been built in the world, if not the top thing ever built in the world, you know, given the time period that they say they were built, which is a lie. So Egypt has got a special situation with its history. It has been utterly gagged by the shortest possible date that they can attribute to it. So they lie to you and tell you that the pyramids are, you know, about 3200 BC with mastabas that go back maybe another four or 500 years. You know, we went from these mastabas, which if you haven't seen what that is, they essentially built sort of these shoe boxes in the sand. They, they had no doors. It was kind of like a, a building without doors, but they had no roof on it. And you had chambers, kind of like you ladies who have the boxes that sort your jewelry. Right? So imagine taking that and building it up to the size of a building, putting it into the ground, and when the pharaoh dies or some dignitary dies, you get, uh, you know, your bodies get put in different compartments. So you and your wife might get put in one compartment. Your maids and assistants go in different compartments because they're murdered the day that, you're, that you die. And animals and things, favorite pets and stuff, and stuff that you need, go in there and they seal it off. At least that's what they've told you what those are. It's, it's plausible. But now since everyone's awakened in that community, or a lot of people have, and people who aren't invited to wake up, mind you, they've gone over and re-researched everything. They've looked at the rocks, and they've looked at the structures. They've looked at what temples look like versus tombs versus these random things called pyramids, which lack any any remote architectural or, uh, I would say, artistic or ceremonial likeness to what they're claimed to be. You know, and they bring in these physicists, they bring in these electrical engineers, and they take a look at things, and they're like, man, this thing is not what you think it is. You know, it looks more indicative of some source of power generation. And then you have your more existential people that study it over time, and they realize that... Uh, this device, shaped like a pyramid, would create sort of a double helix emission of, of power coming off the surface of the world or receiving something from the world. So the first thing I want to do in the first 30 minutes is 
sort of illustrates some of the frustration that you might share with me in that these things are right in front of your face. And what's interesting is when you see something, the more Gnostically programmed you are to communicate with the universe, you are feeling the universe trying to solve this problem right in front of your very face. And you're frustrated. You're frustrated that you can't just get it. You can feel it on you, but you can't quite put it into words yet. The little Lego pieces aren't connecting. The puzzle pieces aren't connecting, right? So there's two halves to the equation. There is how did they put these things together, right? But the more intriguing question is why did they put these things together? And then there's the really mysterious side effects of, you know, why do South American, why did South American people pay homage to folks with beards when they didn't have any until the Europeans came over and crossbred with them? It would seem that we have physical proof that, that someone traveled over there and did something. Now, for those of you who are Lanthians or Lumerian folks or Anunnaki folks or uh, the Archons or what have you, that's a very deep rabbit hole to attach to this. I'm going to let you guys take it deeper until I do my own episodes about these individuals and these potentials. Because if I go down those paths, there's no evidence that those folks existed besides legend. And maybe you could point at these characters that have been carved, but I would rather just deal with what we can see with our own eyes, what, what you could buy a plane ticket tomorrow and go visit. That's where I want to keep this conversation. Because if I start going to mystical, you know, oh, I channeled, you know, knowledge from Planet X, uh, then this episode's over for a lot of you, and, it, and I'm not going down that path. We're going to stay on board here, right? So what kind of structures do we have built over and over and over again? Let's take a look at that real quick. Well, the two that I see the most, okay, are your structures at which it looks like man is supposed to be inside of. How do we define that? Well, I would say the temples of Egypt, you know, your Parthenons and your, your structures in, in Greece, now, your Stonehenge is different. Your Stonehenge doesn't look like it was ever anything to be inside of. It looks like it borrows from the technology that is used to build things you're supposed to be inside of, but it's creating some sort of druid moon calendar. But again, who knows? When you rebuild it from 1954 from scratch, you can infer all kinds of things into it. But there's pretty good evidence of the pile they got these rocks from, that it was pretty much in that circular formation and they did have the wherewithal to at least build the 1954 copy uh, using traditional rocks from that era in and on a predestined circle right so there was a circle on the ground that, that looked like it may have hosted something like this and so they weren't trying to be totally disingenuous right i think it's interesting that the druids of europe have you know ceremoniously taken over and tried to usurp Stonehenge for themselves. The fact that the government allowed this usurpation would really, it really calls out to the fact that whoever actually, you know, put this thing together in 54 did believe that the Druids were the ones. And they held rituals as soon as they finished it. And again, the whole country of England was, were invited to see this thing, even though it was on a military base being built. You know, they didn't shut you off or anything, right? But the two main structures are you have, again, these, these rocks that are stacked up in columns with cross beam rocks. And then from there, you can build all you know, other cross beams and you can get yourself a, a rooftop. And you could line it with vegetation if you want to try and, try and waterproof it. But the other big structure are pyramids. And, you know, so you look at pyramids and it's sort of frustrating and it's sort of beautiful all at the same time, right? Where do we have pyramids? Well, we have them everywhere, depending on what you're willing to acknowledge as a pyramid. Now, the more primitive stack rocked pyramids obviously exist in, in the pre-Inca era. They exist in, obviously, Egypt. They exist in China. They exist 
all throughout Africa. So someone was building these big monolithic structures out of monolithic stones, or megalithic stones, I should say, and just using them for different things, right? Now, what's odd is if you look at the architectural interior of, uh, say, the Aztec slash Mayan slash pre-Inca or pre-Inca pyramids, you have a much different apparent use for the pyramid with steps where human beings were actually invited to proceed up the face of this thing and have rituals at the top, burn fire at the top. In Egypt, you have it capped off with a pair of meridian stone of probably gold, and you have the varying levels of conductivity in the materials. So the outer, outer limestone was non-conductive. The interior limestone, which is 96% of the entire uh, structure, is very conductive. And then you have red granite, which is considered a liquid rock to electricians, forming the internal um, corridors of the place, right? And it's all built to express amazing phonics. When you sing inside the caverns of the Great Pyramid, it harmonizes with you. It's amazing. Why are there pyramids all over the world with seemingly different functionality attached to them? And what could they have been? Are they individual structures that are just created per society for whatever kind of spiritualistic ritual that is currently in vogue in that particular part of the region of the world at that particular level of evolution in mankind? And then how does this knowledge of how to build a pyramid kind of spread all over the world? Well, I will tell you, I will remind you that most of you have played in the sand in your lifetime, or if nothing else, you've played in the dirt. And it doesn't take more than a child to realize that when you dig up a bunch of dirt and you move it to another location and you pick it up with your hands and you drop it down, a pyramid creates itself. And you pat it down with your hands, especially when you hit the beach for the very first time as a child. And you realize, you know, moist sand, you can turn into sandcastles. But before you start creating these amazing sculptures in the sand as a teenager or someone in their 20s and above, you start creating pyramids. So the hint or the clue to build a pyramid, I think, is in a fundamental understanding of man. Now, having said that, you know, there are natural angles of pyramids when you drop um when you drop dirt and you drop sand, it's bizarre how the angles of ascent uh, and lean and slope on the edge of these structures are very similar, whether or not you're doing it in sand or dirt. So it seems as if man could have learned sort of a beautiful natural curve to this process just from playing around. But again, the pyramids are really different, aren't they? I mean, the one in China, I don't know anything about the one in China that is... Uh, you know, they supposedly dug underneath it and found the, um, the soldiers for the particular regime that was going in those times. And again, you look at those Chinese soldiers and you look at their faces and you look at the geometry and you look at how many they are, there are and the fact that they're all different. And, you know, the legend is, is that they are actually mocking real soldiers, that when you passed away inside, I don't know if it's the Ming Dynasty or whatever, but in one of the dynasties, when you passed away, they made a soldier in your likeness. It's phenomenal, right? Now they've been in mummy movies, right? Animated. As bad guys, of course. But now let me drop some theory on you. And this is not completely new. I think maybe the associations I'll make might be a little new. I saw recently a picture that so, someone supposedly t had taken of a, um, I believe it was a mock pyramid of the Great Pyramid inside some laboratory, and they were running sound frequencies through it and took a picture of it. And again, there's only, in, in my knowledge, to my knowledge, there's only one photograph taken by one guy, so, you know, whatever. But exuding from the pyramid was a double helix shape of energy slash sound. And they've taken this photograph of it. Now again, regardless of your belief of where we are in the universe, uh, one thing is for certain, mass and energy spins, right? As, as dictated by the spinning of the ethereal particle. Go see my episode on gravity to fully understand what gravity is and what we are. 
So it seems to be a commonality. You know, in, in order to make life occur, you have to move energy. You do, regardless of what that is. You have to move it from point A to point B. Otherwise, you don't have life. You have a static world. And so we know there's this ecosystem of movement, this current of movement, some infinite Mobius strip of, of the path of all energy, whether it be an infinite loop, some sphere turned inside out, or some infinite plane, doesn't really matter. We can accept today that things spin. Our own, you know, double helix is a spinning sort of vortex of energy, and, you know, the nucleic acids are invited into that realm, and when they all kind of coalesce and bang into each other, we get our alpha code that is our DNA, right? But there was a movie written by a NASA scientist slash sci-fi writer, Arthur C. Clarke. You hear me reference it all the time. A 2001 A Space Odyssey. Or 2001 A Space Odyssey. And if you read his 2010 and 3001 books, he reveals what the monolith is over time. It's a mystery for the first two films, and then if you read the book, it's sort of kind of a wah-wah ending to this thing. And it seems like an old guy trying to be technically hip which is interesting. But if we take away our movie review of him, what's interesting about it is there is logic in, in his story flow, which is the following. In 2001 A Space Odyssey, you have this black monolith shows up. It's transparent in the book. But it shows up to prehistoric ape man. And of course, that's a big evolutionary sort of, sort of homage but hey, evolution was so hip back in those days, right? And this monolith talks to the monkeys. And I just gave an example of this in one of my last episodes. So I will not go into this in detail. But the monolith teaches man things and man starts to prog progress up. And then it disappears and it hides itself on the moon. And then it's discovered on the moon. And then it teleports itself out to the, uh, you know, the orbit of Jupiter. And it takes several years to get to it, which is what 2010 is all about, right? Going and visiting it. But by 3001, the monolith is redefined or further defined as a computer that is there to transfer messages to mankind and tell mankind what to do. And in a true Independence Day slash average computer hacking movie, Mankind sends a virus up into the monolith and shuts it off, potentially crashing the operating system of our controllers, some alien race someplace else in the universe. Right? Now, for those of you who are heliocentric, globe-Earth people that believe in the aliens coming from another world, you're going to have a connection to this for your reasons. And for those of you who believe in a flat disk, you will have an equal amount of significance from where you're coming from in that either the dome owners or God himself is potentially working through this theory I'm going to throw at you. And I'm not trying to be, you know, incredibly serious about this assertion, but it's just something that Gnostically is kind of coming to me and I want to share it. It feels like a thread in the sweater, even, you know. Sometimes threads aren't exactly the, uh, the information you're looking for, they are merely the clue to what you're looking for, right? But isn't it interesting that everywhere that pyramids exist, there seems to be a fairly advanced version of society who also live there? Now, the obvious thing that you might think about as an archaeologist, anthropologist, and historian is that, of course, this is the byproduct of, of eventually achieving intelligence. You have to have intelligence before you build a pyramid, right? But let's look at it from a common denominator standpoint. Why do, you know, incredibly intelligent, civilized uh, sections of world history seem to get to the pyramid stage? You know, if you look in Cambodia, it looks as if they went way beyond the pyramid stage within seconds. They built temples that that accentuate the, um, the solstices, right? They've got a temple where they've got three temples, one in the center slightly higher, two smaller ones, and winter solstice, the sun comes up over the, the dome of uh, one of the buildings and, and uh, uh, 
in the other solstice, it comes on the other building, on the right. Amazing. Now, I think there's a bit of a novelty in, you know, you have to build the place where the person has to stand. And this is where the Cambodians did it. They built, you know, you stand on this particular stone and, the, you know, this solstice thing, winter and summer, are going to show up in these particular spots. We figured it out. Now, technically speaking, you got enough old guys standing around potentially living a lot longer than we live today. And they just kind of say, well, this rock was always here. So it's sort of like the rock where everyone hangs out. And so they track, you know, where the sun comes up. Well, cause whatever, what else are they going to do? Right. They don't have to do a day job like we do today. So they're, they're looking and looking and recording and recording. And then they finally figure out the geometry of building something on the ground, almost a two, two dimensional plane projection on top of the surface of the earth. such that if you build two towers here, Boom, boom, you've got the solstices locked in. Why not make one in the center that we can uh, say is the unification of the two, right? It must have been interesting to build these buildings and get all that accuracy down, but really have no communion with the sun in the end. You're just sort of paying homage to the sun just in case it is a living being that is paying attention. Or perhaps you have a higher being that watches over you, right? But for those of you who have dabbled in the notion that our DNA and a lot of our um, hair follicles and that sort of thing act as antenna, antennae to the universe, perhaps we're receiving messages. Perhaps we're receiving programming from a particular part of the universe, whether it be our creator, as in some omnipotent, omnipresent God, or the next step down, which would be one of his creations that would be an alien race with the vocational ability to create us. Whether it be through gene splicing with hominids, which bones seem to suggest and DNA seems to suggest, or just working with us while we're here, right? But what if pyramids, first built small, then built bigger, provide a sort of wireless you know, almost cell phone tower experience for mankind. When you build them small, you start getting more epiphanies because that shape catches information from the universe and broadcasts it out because of its shape. I mean, if you think about it, if you take a pyramid and you draw a perpendicular line on every, all four sides of this thing, and then you make a cone around that perpendicular line, then it's a pretty good little distribution hub of information. And perhaps, like the monolith in Arthur C. Clarke's story, it simply rebroadcasts, perhaps, perhaps if nothing else, just the thoughts of man. But perhaps it is taking information from the universe and broadcasting it to man. There's a series of hieroglyphs out of Egypt which show a pyramid receiving a sort of broadcast from space right to the pyramidian tip stone. And then there's a ricochet off of that into the third eye of the pharaohs. And remember, you know, I think that the Egyptians really utterly and completely nailed whatever's going on. They not only nailed it, but they built... They tried to build it in stone in such a way that we could benefit from it. I would say all save them writing passages about it in hieroglyphs. But we know that the Christians went down there and the Romans went down there, and especially the Christians though, and they destroyed a tremendous amount of Egypt, especially the reliefs of you know, the, the, if you listen to historians, they'll tell you it was only, only where leaders were, you know, put an effigy in a rock so they would get rid of, say, King Tut or something off of a stone. I'm sure that occurred too. But that doesn't really threaten the Christian church, does it? To say that uh, Caesar existed doesn't really modify anyone's belief in, say, Jesus Christ. It doesn't do anything for you. So someone said, oh, you know, they went down there and knocked out a bunch of Rox has said the leaders who existed back in those days, uh, it doesn't make any sense. There's no motivation there. But if it does one of two things, there's a reason to destroy the information in Egypt. One, 
they predate Christianity and the Old Testament by tens of thousands of years. You know, Graham Hancock came back with photographs where we believe on a wall we've got 35,000 years of pharaohs with symbols for year and month. And consequently, for your flat earthers, it's a circle around a solid disk is a year and a circle around an empty disk is a month. All right? Suggesting the orbit of Earth around the Sun is a year, and the orbit of the Moon around the Earth, being darker, is a month. It sure feels like somebody is pretty heliocentric in that model, and they've been out there and they've seen it. Or whoever taught them what they did had seen it. But the second thing, besides just literal history, going back further than their fake story, okay, because it is a completely fake story, okay? Is to get rid of any methodology to find the truth. Truth that had already been found, and the mechanism to harvest truth out of the universe, say, like a Gnostic, like a, like a Nostradamus or someone, right? Or a Philip K. Dick. For the Americas, we have the Europeans coming over and talking to, again, the Incas, talking to the Native Americans, and they all say that there were races before them that built the things that we see. So South America is, again, packed with this pre-Incan architecture made of megalithic stones, right? And some are smooth and sort of roundish, where they put these rocks together very precisely, had no mortar, maybe some, again, some uh, keystone T-joints in there, supposedly poured with metal, which seems to boggle the mind a little bit. And then you have that super precise Egyptian sort of cut. Again, Turkey has theirs. I mean, it's, I'm neglecting a lot of, of countries that have these things in them. I'll try to show them in the photographs. But the Native Americans were the ones that said, look, there were giant humans here before us. And they've only recently become extinct. And we'll show you where they're buried. Now, I'm going to do a whole episode on giant humans. I want to get all my research together. But supposedly, you know, written in books that are published, all right, by these official agencies, not by conspiracy theorists, the Smithsonian scientists, or scientists associated with the Smithsonian, have validated and verified that they found human beings from, you know, skeletal remains of human beings from 7 feet to supposedly over 20 feet. There are documentaries on YouTube where anthropologists go through the old books and prove to you and hand them out to the audience to say, look, does this look real? I didn't go and have this published somewhere. These pages have gone through various uh, acidic wear and tear although they're not put it on acidic, acidic paper, thank God. But, you know, people's hands and stuff create patina on the pages. It takes centuries to do that. And they prove it. These skeletal remains were picked up and removed to erase history, to secure history in the eyes of the European banking slash oligarchy rich kids who want to say they invent everything. I mean, just think about it. You take a whole world and you convince them that you created everything, that the blue-blooded white people created everything that's amazing. I mean, you go to Egypt today and you look around, it's a pretty primitive place. I'm not saying it's not fun to be there and fun to be Egyptian, but you think about it. You have all of the busts of Egypt extremely African, like... Black males, black females, they rendered themselves. Again, the further back you go in the dynasty, obviously you're getting the more... Uh, and it, it's, it's probably the very first time I'm super duper happy that we're very different biologically on the outside because it allows us to look at King Tut's bust and say that is not an Arab, okay? That's a black guy. And they rendered themselves in really dark skin in the hieroglyphs when they had a chance to paint them. And we're talking about they have a 100,000% capability of rendering exactly what they see. Some of the, you know, the amazing uh, facial 
structures of old pharaohs they are utterly perfect you can cut the left side of the face out photoshop it over to match the right side of the face and the geometry is exactly the same and it's all based on pi unbelievable mach machine precision precision stuff and we don't uh really know how we would make them today I mean, we got laser printers but cutting cutting uh Granite with a computerized arm is something we haven't built a device to do, but they did it back in those days. And it's not some guy looking at the left, looking at the right, take a little bit off there, look at there. I, no way. Unbelievably advanced stuff, right? Consequently, the, the more that the hieroglyphs become closer and closer to the Ptolemy stage when Rome took over Egypt, the skin color gets a bit lighter because they kept getting invaded and kept getting crossbred and, and leadership changed and the race literally changed. Now someone asked me the other day, because I make this assertion that the Egyptians were black and, and what's really crazy is I could show them the busts of you know as many pharaoh tombs as they want and they're all African black people. And they look straight at it, and I know that they know I'm not lying, that I didn't make the King Tut, you know, tomb mask, right, out of gold and, and ebony and all these other beautiful quartz rocks and stuff. But they go, okay, I have a hard time believing this because when I look at Africa today and we look at all the tribes and stuff, and, you know, there's definitely cities and things, they seem to be so primitive. How could they possibly have built the pyramids? And I say, well, that doesn't, one doesn't negate the other. One is proof, and one is something you just need to figure out. But now think about it. If you were in a utopia, if we were able to make any city in, in the world a utopian city, L.A., New York, and you're able to exist like that for, say, a hundred years, let's say, a thousand years, where would your military go? Would you really create a military? Right. That's why all this socialistic, you know, UN bullshit and EU bullshit about, you know, they really are alluring us to or trying to lure us to a um, sort of utopian future. But they want to create a world army. I think that armies disappear once you reach these beautiful realms where generation after generation are born. And no one perceives war. Because you're intelligent and you understand the ramifications of war the lack of benefit of war the sad nature of war and so you stop and so we have these cultures that could be wiped out in a day as long as there's a barbaric culture somewhere that is still living off the old the old dna so it may be that these cultures have a couple different storylines the Egyptian pharaohs that set up Egypt, again, probably as far back as, say, 40,000 B.C. We need to touch on Ice Age theory for one second, too. But they either did one of two things. They were either genetically wiped out, even though we have Africans that still exist in Africa that seem to uh, be very similar in design. And, you know, for those of you who, you know, look at uh, folks from Africa and you can immediately tell the different types of genetic tribes, and you can see the shape of their skull and what have you, there does seem to be this similarity uh, among the pharaohs. Of course, they're very inbred, very incestual. People argue with me about this, and, it, and you know, I studied this intensely for six years. I mean, OD'd on this all year round for six years straight, and it could be it could be uh, ancestral claims might be something the white man did to the history of the pharaohs, but we believe that the hieroglyphs of the pharaohs' names uh, and cartouches absolutely conclude that that an offspring of one, you know, pharaoh married the off same offspring of the same pharaoh, and they became the new dynasty. You're supposed to hand it down, and you weren't supposed to crossbreed with anyone because you weren't to lose the genetic intelligence that you managed to manifest by not being oppressed, right? You know, it was the kings and queens of Europe that were really big into crossing over kingdoms, right? So, you know, if one person had land and one person had food, they, it would be great if they got together, especially if their border 
border communities and then the country got bigger and bigger and bigger and it just started going underneath family names but Egypt was Egypt north and south united supposedly by their fictitious characters Menes M-E-N-E-S I mean maybe that pharaoh existed and, and you know he was the one that got everyone to behave but maybe they just did the unthinkable maybe they left Maybe that particular tribe simply said, we have done what we need to do. Man is well on their way. We have given them the mathematical knowledge that they need. And here it goes. Boom, straight into Greece. The Greeks did a beautiful job taking the Egyptian architecture and moving it to the next level. Now, of course, that latter suggestion would suggest that they were way beyond the intelligence that we think we see in many of the structures, right? Again, I've said it before, one of the things I learned about Egyptian architecture and architecture in general throughout history of mankind is when you build a temple, any type of structure that man's supposed to be inside of, the, the distance between the columns suggests and pretty much records in history the level of advancement of that particular culture. Okay, so you have pretty close columns. I mean, again, they're really far apart because they're really massive in Egypt. But once you get to the Parthenon and a lot of Greek architecture, the columns moved apart quite a bit. And the architectural techniques were very similar. All right, you stack a bunch of rocks up and keep cutting them into these cylindrical shapes. And so it's a bunch of sort of donuts on top of each other to create these columns. It's not like they cut them out of the ground like obelisks. All right? But there's two ways to leave Earth, right? There is of your own mechanical ability where you actually develop science that can get you off the planet which is probably not likely with what we saw left behind and then there's someone coming to get you and pulling you out of the mix for those of you who believe in a flat disc it could be the dome owners for those of you who believe in aliens it could just be the aliens or no one left they simply bestowed on to man through pyramid structures of transmitting data very much like a, a monolith to man what they needed to know, and then it just, once they got us all kind of programmed up, they said, okay, now it's time just to watch the experiment go. We've juiced it up. But let's look at Ice Age theory. The scientific evidence for Ice Ages has to do with what we believe to be glacier movements on Earth, right? Or as the Britons call it, glaciers. They believe that they have been able to photograph, you know, the growth and shrinking of glaciers. Don't ask Al Gore about this. And they believe that a lot of the corrosive nature of the surface of the earth is made by glaciers. For instance, they tried to tell you that a glacier dug out the Grand Canyon. All right, well, I'm going to tell you right now, unequivocally, no glacier created the Grand Canyon. What created the Grand Canyon is what we call expanding earth. When the crust expands, which it does currently about 19 centimeters a year, it rips apart the surface of the earth. What's fascinating about geology, okay, is that to become a geologist, and I, I do apologize to those of you who are geologists, you know, you may be one of the more creative ones if you're listening to the show like this, but it's a pretty dry science. You know, you... Um, it's totally exciting when you go down the Grand Canyon and you're looking for various, you're looking at the various sedimentary layers and you're pulling out rocks that have been stuck in there for, you know, billions of years. It's going to be, it can be very exciting to, to be one of those folks. But you are typically kind of a very academic person and you're really likely to be a person not to think very much for yourself. And the fossil fuel designation of crude oil is one of the key points of evidence that Geologists don't think that much. Because again, we find oil eight miles down in the ground when all life and fossil history stops at 16,000 feet, which is just three miles down, roughly, right? I had someone tell me the other day that they believe that uh, the reason why you can find oil really deep is that the, um, you know, the surface of the earth every once in a while goes underneath another sliding plate, which again is Pangea Drift, which is complete bullshit. And that's why oil is down there really deep. And I said, well, then you would carry the fossil record also very deep, which has never been discovered beyond 16,000 feet, roughly. 
So their theory just completely blows up in their face. But let me ask you this question. I could almost make an episode about this, but I can't lament that far. Why do you think mountains exist? Right? Why do you think that they exist? If you listen to Pangea Drift horse shit, it'll, they'll tell you, oh, well, it's, you know, these plates slamming against each other, and then they, they kind of do this big, you know, collision, and they make a mountain. So Mount, Mount Everest is nothing more than a giant plate collision. I'm going to suggest it's not, okay? I'm going to suggest through expanding Earth that all you're seeing are the remnants of the old surface. I've said this in previous episodes. If you look at uh, South west Arizona, along the 10, Highway 10, you see these plateaus. You see these rocks that go straight up. You always see them in old westerns. It's in Westworld. It's in the Lone Ranger remake. They go way up and they make a plateau. What you're looking at is the old surface of the earth. And as it expanded, it created these huge gaps where the soil you know, went down with the new larger circumference uh, of the earth. In some cases, you have the Black Sea rips apart. What if the Black Sea was empty? What would you call it? You would call it the Grand Canyon. All the bumps on the other side match bumps on this side. It was ripped apart by expanding Earth, right? I mention this digression for one reason, to go back to something I have threaded through a lot of episodes and went into great detail in the gravity episode. But when we study some of the sort of oral history, especially of South America, They talk about the magic earth. They talk about how these stones are moved into place, these giant megalithic stones. And they talk about methodology of human labor and the magic force of earth. The magic earth is how it's referenced in several of the translations. I'm sure it's a different word, technically speaking. But it seems to correlate with the stages of the earth's bowels to assist in the creation of these big structures. Now imagine, again, the Tesla, the man that actually invented something, other than the fucking hack, Einstein, who invented nothing besides bullshit mathematical theories, which you have to jump into the mathematical paradigm to gain any insight into what he was saying. It's an interesting exercise in mental thinking, but very useless for us today. But if the world had an electric core, and if the supply of dielectric waves gives something, either it's gravity or not gravity, it works on a flat disk, works on a round globe, don't worry about it. But the surface of the Earth would exude this electricity, or partial electricity, right? You have magnetism and dielectric power come together to create electromagnetism. We dig electromagnetism in experiments because that allows us to move ether, allows us to move things in gravity, right? The Hutchison effect, right? It's all the same shit, people. People are like, oh my God, have you seen the Hutchison effect? I'm like, yeah, there's pure proof of how ethereal winds work. When you see this, uh, they did this uh, little experiment where they have a fairly large lead column that under certain electromagnetic stimulation twirls itself and just just basically turns itself into twisty bread because that's the wave of ether varying its dielectric supply which creates either an implosion or an explosion of gravity right in the video it's imploding in the vector of ether albeit a very macro form of it right but what if the world is exuding this energy on a massive level and every rock if pushed on a particular meridian, right, and you could just test it by taking a smaller rock, let's say you take a 10 pound rock, and you just walk around with it. And these builders from the past hold it in a particular area, and it, oh, and all of a sudden it weighs an ounce. Okay, they put a little marker in the ground, they say this is where the meridian's coming out today. Could be moved tomorrow. Maybe they even knew that the currents of it moved. Maybe they chased the currents of the meridian lines all around the world. Because again, if man has been around for, uh, intelligently, I would say, for 100 to 200,000 years BC, but erased by modern bankers and, you know, bullshit artists, 
we would not believe that that would be possible. But if we were to exist, let's just say, let's just do it as an example, 100,000 BC, we were really intelligent, mechanically intelligent. Then the reason why bearded men showed up in the Americas was perhaps they were chasing it from the European communities, maybe chasing it from some of these islands that tend to disappear. You know, when the Earth expands, the ocean can start taking over more land masses. And so you don't necessarily have to have a cataclysmic thing to get rid of Atlantia, Lumeria. You just have the water level goes up. Off the coast of Japan, all these places in the world, you have these hidden cities underwater. And sometimes they're only 50 feet down, sometimes they're 100 feet down. Well, they were on the surface at one point, obviously, right? But no one's willing to explain that. Pangea Drift does nothing to explain that. Okay, Expanding Earth completely explains that. But isn't it interesting, every time you study these megalithic structures, they typically have abandoned building practices. One of the biggest uh, megalithic stones in the world was just abandoned in the digging quarry. They had shaped it, they had moved it out of the quarry a little bit, and it's on a slant, and it just sat there. The Egyptians have uh, obelisks everywhere that are still in transit, still in the quarries. It's as if someone just picked up and took off. Well, that's how the historians love to tell the story. Well, the Incas didn't build this stuff, otherwise they would have continued the process. So a previous civilization to the Incas put together a lot of those, those digs down there in South America, right? And they like to say that people just picked up and left. A lot of the assertions are they would run out of food. They would over-harvest their food. Eh, that seems pretty, pretty ridiculous for cultures that were smart enough to build granaries and all kinds of other stuff. It doesn't make any sense with their discovered artifacts. They're not that stupid. Maybe they were trying to chase the Meridian, and they ended up in a different area of the world. But if the world keeps going through these metabolical sort of electrical cycles, and perhaps it's dictated by the sun. You know, if we have an electrical core, as Tesla proved in Colorado, if the sun goes through some sort of burping phase and really ejects a lot of, of the prime components, either dielectric waves or magnetism waves or fully metabolized electromagnetic waves, and they get to Earth and they pass through the crust because they can then Earth has an abundance of this energy and starts to exude it out of its crust. And when that occurs, stone specifically, porous stone, and its geological makeup hangs on to the electromagnetic waves coming out of Earth, or dielectric waves, and things become weightless. Or they simply don't weigh as much. And so all this stuff can be created by little men walking around, right? Now it doesn't... Uh, what is left out there to be explained is, again, all the craftsmanship of these rocks. And again, if you buy a book, uh, just look up a book, 39,000 B.C. It does a, inside the book is pretty much your photographic proof that the Egyptians had circular saws. They had all kinds of modern equipment, and it's not found in necessarily all of the structures. It is there, but it's a little harder to find because everything's refined in the end. But you have all these little stones hanging around the temples, hanging around the pyramids that are just kind of fodder. Sort of the excess rock that was cut off. And they've magnified photographs and they've proven that there were circular saws because the path of the cut is circular but consistent. They have bored holes that are perfectly round, cut out of rock. It's beautiful. It's proof. Something was different than what your pasty white historians would tell you. But let's, let's hone back on perhaps alien participation because there's a lot of, I think, fairly nonsensical conclusions that are very popular in sort of your more fringy archaeologists, anthropologists. And, you know, I, I salute them 100% in, in postulating this. Because without postulation, we don't have any, we don't often consider something to be true or false without someone asserting that it might be true or false, right? But anytime they see 
a giant field. They'll call it a potential runway. Okay. When I was a kid, the Giza Plateau, which is a massive, massive structure that the pyramids are built on top of, which, again, in my research, they said it's taller than the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid's 455 feet tall, so the Giza Plateau's, you know, 460 to 500 feet tall down inside the earth, right? Structurally, it makes complete sense because when we pile drive for buildings here in um, California and sort of the wetlands area, they pile drive exactly the height of the building into the ground to make sure it doesn't fall over during an earthquake, right? But the funny thing is, is that these assertions were developed in, in, back in a time when man had to land airplanes with wheels on them. You had a forward velocity that then loses altitude, the tires touch, and we go for a little ways until we can bring the vehicle to a stop, and then we stop it. And so everything became runways, right? Now, with you know, decent science fiction for the last 40 years, we now portray these spaceships, any type of UFO, as being completely capable of landing, you know. I misquoted uh, the same movie twice in a couple episodes back. 1951 was the day the Earth stood still, not Forbidden Planet, and I said Forbidden Planet twice, unfortunately. So, the day the Earth stood still, which is a byproduct of probably, gosh, 50 years before that with H.G. Wells, you know... Uh, a flying saucer lands in the middle of a baseball field in Washington, D.C. Just lands straight down. There's no runway. So our thinking as human beings advanced to a point where we no longer think of everything being runways. Now, for those of you about aircraft carriers, you could say, well, it's not really a runway. It's an area where a bunch of ships would land and get out and do their thing. The big, the big no-go path for my brain, meaning the big sort of contradictory path of aliens participating directly in the construction of these locations is that I, I would think that if we as mankind were to travel to another planet, I'm not sure we would, you know, grab indigenous stones and move them all over their planet surface to create sort of structures we can get inside of. Uh, I don't know that we wouldn't bring our own structures with us. You know, there's been all these fabled trips to the moon that they're going to plan and you know the japanese have been doing planning for 40 years at least you know building structures out of the dust but building very intelligent you know man-made hexagons that can be used to you know combine to make structures right if any of you have seen an episode of star trek when they um any one of the series when they land on a on a planet they usually at least uh, voyager and beyond they brought their own equipment they brought their own little campers and and, you know, double wide mobile homes and stuff. And they were able to stay down. There's one where Chakotay and uh, Captain Janeway are stuck together due to some virus that they have. And, you know, they brought their own stuff. So, you know, the idea that every, every alien installation would have been discovered and then captured by man, I guess it's technically possible. But there's no fable of such a thing. Right? They kept everyone's mouth shut forever. Seems pretty hard to believe. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but it just, you know, we have to think it further if we're going to postulate that aliens landed here, right? Was it the movie Stargate did a pretty, pretty funny twist that the pyramids were merely sort of landing pads for gigantic spaceships, right? Yeah, it's a very beautiful uh, assertion, but the idea that you would build a craft that could only land on a pyramid. It seems pretty ridiculous, right? We got to build a pyramid. Why? Well, we got to land. Oh, yeah, that's right. We can't land just by ourselves. Right. Still, it was a fun story. But what do we have to gain by figuring out all this stuff? I think one, uh, for those of us who understand that history is being revised on a unbelievable level by those who we wouldn't want to be ruled by, there's a defense mechanism that kicks into place to say, no, 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 you guys don't get to tell history anymore. You've had your, your network television for the last 80 years, and we are, we're bringing this to a close. Normal human beings with minds that are open, that can think, with the skill sets to make connections, they have multiple disciplines, not just one discipline, or if they have only one discipline, they're smart enough to bring the other people with them, that might have correlating pieces of science with them. They're going back out and they're researching everything. Now, when that occurs, I'll just 
throw this out there and make sure we all understand. We don't need to jump up their butts if we think that they're wrong. Let's give them some credit for finding the money to get funded to go out and do this research at all. It's very important research because they're sort of doing a twofold contribution to mankind in our prehistoric history. One, they're undoing the shitty history that we've been told. So that's the very first thing that they can do. The next thing they're trying to do is they're trying to, trying to assert what might have occurred by using logic and science, right? More like Tesla science and not like Einstein science, right? So really tangible sciences that, that yield invention and proof. I will do an episode of Einstein where we utterly shred this guy. I'm still just collecting the... There's so much evidence against Einstein being who he was that it's going to take me probably a week just to make my notes and figure out how to approach this. The guy's a complete fucking fraud. Unbelievable plagiarist, wife beater, etc., etc. He is Peter Sellers and being there. But we want to know who we are, right? And we believe, I think quite accurately, the further back we can go and find out what we what we accomplished, where we came from, whether it be evolution or creation or intelligent design or all the above, it will bring solace to some of us to know who we are. There's that old saying, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. Huge amount of truth to that. Which is why I do believe that the folks, there are several folks at NASA that have been, you know, briefed on the fact that we haven't gone to Mars, we haven't gone to the moon, we barely can, you know, get space travel worked out in low orbit. But someone tells them that story, hey, look, if these kids believe that that's what we're doing, our culture slash America, being the, uh, the head of the snake for NASA, more kids jump into science, and eventually we will get there. Eventually we'll find out. But if we don't energize through fiction, it won't happen. Now, I don't personally subscribe to that at all. I think that the 10x version of that formula is to tell kids that we didn't go to the moon and say, wouldn't you like to go? Why don't you be the first to go? Why don't you figure out the science to get there? And everything that you create has to be published you know, you don't have hidden F-1 booster rockets that couldn't possibly have gotten us to the moon. You don't have a bunch of bullshit, you know, ig uh, ignoring of science that might prevent us from traveling in space due to just electromagnetic radiation. And on that note, if you think about it, you do have Africans that if they are related to the pharaohs, they don't believe so. An African kid waking up in some tribe, if you were to take them on a little field trip and show them the pyramids and say, you know what? Your DNA, your people made that. And all that knowledge has been lost out of your people. So, why don't you get some books opened up, some nice mathematical books that teach you about pi and structural sciences, and why don't you see if you've got that recessive gene tucked way back inside your DNA that can activate. Why don't you see if you can't figure this all out again? And we'll organically look at how you did it, if you're able to do it in the next 500 years, and or maybe 50 years, because we have so much you know, science now and computers to and engineering software to speed up the process. Maybe we'll find out more about ourselves simply by trying to create this stuff from scratch. Same goes for South America, right? Go up to an Inca. They don't really... None of this is really lost on them, but to say, look... Perhaps your DNA is the, uh, the group of people that built this, but perhaps not. But you have daily access to all the stuff that they did do. Get into it. And stop letting people tell you what is true before you start. Luckily, there are brilliant people out there trying to figure this stuff out. I think we need to help them by opening our own minds and taking another look. Most people are interested in this kind of stuff, but it's sort of this, it's a difficult thing to study, let's put it that way, because you'll go into the sciences of it all and you will be bombarded by official science, quote unquote, that really is built to close your mind. And it's built to close your mind in a very simple way, just like the moon missions and all this other stuff. If they say they figured it out, 
you don't have any curiosity. And curiosity is by far the most inexhaustible force in human consciousness. When you think you can't solve something like God, man just continues going and going and going, right? There's an old 1991 episode of Star Trek Generations where they bump into what they think is a black hole. They all pass out for what they believe is 30 seconds. And later you find out that they had actually discovered a planet that didn't want to be discovered. And so they fake a black hole and they do this little memory wipe on the, uh, the crew. But they unfortunately didn't cover all the bases in the first attempt. And so everyone started looking around going, well, this couldn't happen. And his hand's been broken and mended. And these plants grew a whole day when they were only supposed to be out 30 seconds. And so they kept digging and digging until they went back to the location and found the class one or class M planet that was trying to be hidden. And they nearly got killed because they, they made a mistake. They left curiosity behind. And Picard has a great monologue about the power of curiosity for man. Something we need to remember. So for any of you who are digging this episode, and you're like, yeah, you know, I am interested in that, but I haven't gone back and taken a look. I will tell you that the amount of videos coming out today on YouTube, which are presentations by scientists who have an open mind and have rejected all of the official history of the world, they're really on a roll right now. It's ex it's an exploding trend on YouTube for those of you who are into that sort of thing. And of course, if you view YouTube, the last thing you ever want to do is look at trending videos and what's popular because it's all mega indoctrination. Mega indoctrination. I think you feel me. Deepthoughtsradio.com for all the feeds. There's video if you're on audio, audio if you're on video. For videos, your choices are youtube.com and vid.me. As I always say, vid.me has the most pristine version of season one because I was using um, rock and roll songs, my whole music library. Someone asked me what music I like, and the answer is go watch vid.me season one. And all the intro music is the kind of stuff that's sitting on my computer. Very diverse. For audio, you've got iTunes, Google Play, or you just take your mobile phone and go to deepthoughtsradio.com, click on the lower right icon, which is the RSS feed, and it will find whatever podcast reader you have on your phone. If you visit it on your home computer, it will barf out a really ugly page, so don't worry about that. Don't do that. Let's get out there and rediscover who the hell we are, right? Doesn't it sound like fun? You can do it at your own leisure. Anyway, take care of yourself and someone else, and I will see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now.